So why, you know, why should we do it? Most elected offices in the U.S., and there's a lot of them, like half a million, right, um, are local offices. Um, so most of the races that we could be running for as Greens, whether partisan or not, are on the local level, right? There's only there's about you know 500, you know, to, to just very loosely round. There's 500 on the federal level, right? Um, in states, you probably you maybe have a few more hundred for state level, um, you know, legislature and stuff like that. State level, um, you know, cabinet positions if those are elected in your state. The rest of them. Thousands upon thousands in every state are local offices, school boards, park boards, city council, right? Edu there's education, but there's road districts and education boards. And, you know, if you're in California or Texas, they have some crazy ones like, uh, you know, railroad commissioner, which actually in Texas regulates a whole lot of stuff, including, I believe, the oil industry, right? In, um, in, in California, there are, you know, basically recreation boards um, that are oriented around tourism and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of things to get involved in. It's easier to get on the ballot for a lot of these races. Um, it's easier to run a campaign on a local scale, right? Once you start running statewide and federal offices, we're talking, you know, you have to have a serious operation if you're going to compete. Um, you know, you, you've got to get hundreds of thousands of votes. Uh, if you're running for, you know, Congress or something like that. And that takes a lot of work. That takes a, a team that takes a, a party to support you. Right. So local campaigns can provide a stepping stone to those larger campaigns. They allow you to build relationships. They allow you to build skills and experience. And then after you've ran them and hopefully seen some success in local campaigns, and we'll talk later about what success means, because it doesn't necessarily mean winning. Um, but once you've done that, it's a lot easier to jump up to a state house and then from there jump up to a you know U.S. house and then from there jump up to a Senate or a, a gubernatorial campaign, right? Um, we can use these local races um, as stepping stones to, to get to the larger ones. Another really important point is elected officials can bring real change in their communities, right? And e they can even be a driving force in shifting policy and, and, and politics nationally. Um, in, in a local office, you can more easily push through your ideas compared to um, being the lone green in Congress, right? It's not the, the squad isn't even alone, right? As representatives of the progressive flank of the Democratic Party. But even with, you know, half a dozen to a dozen of them, they're complete, they have no power, right? They, they were completely bold, you know, bulldozed on the Build Back Better and the, um, you know, the continuing resolutions that came out of that, right? They, they got promises that they would, they that if they backed the infrastructure bill, they would make sure that the social spending bill was attached and it wasn't even after they were promised, right? So even if we win a U.S. House seat, if, it's, if we're alone, then we just end up caucusing with the Democratic Party like Bernie Sanders, right? We get lost in the sauce. We get sucked up. Um, but on the local level, it's a lot easier to push through ideas, right? If you want to get something passed in Congress, you need hundreds of votes to support you. If you want to get something passed, even on a big city council like Chicago, right, 26 votes wins. That's all you need to move. Um, so it's a whole lot easier, whether it be through, you know, political or, or popular, you know, um, citizen pressure or just the backroom dealings that are politics, right? It's a lot easier to push ideas through on the local level. And it can be a testing ground to prove the viability of, of our policy ideas, right? So we can say, look, no, it works, right? We, we pushed through a, a municipal broadband and look what it did, it massively increased access, it drove down prices, right? Um, and so we can use it as a test case for those things. And there are examples of Greens successfully doing that, right? Um, I think it's New Plots. Uh, New York had a mayor, a green mayor before gay marriage was legal. He just started marrying people as the justice of the peace, right? And he got in trouble for doing it, right? And where the marriage is legal, uh, probably technically not because it was illegal in New York at the time. But it brought the issue to the forefront and it moved the needle on it, right? And he was able to do that because he was the elected official and he was officially a justice of this peace and he could marry you, right? And so he did it and he said, screw New York law. 
New York laws it is homophobic and bigoted and anyone should be able to marry who they want. And he was able to unilaterally push it. Um, Gail McLaughlin is another example of a green mayor, you know, really pushing changes during the uh, housing crisis in, in the uh, late aughts. Gail McLaughlin was a mayor in California. She used eminent domain to take over houses publicly that were going to be foreclosed on to stop the families from getting kicked out, right? She was able to completely um, reorganize their police department um, and orient it towards a community control of the police uh, you know, foundation. And it massively reduced crime, right? Massively reduced violent crime in their, in the, in their community. So just by getting into this, you know, lower level local position of power, we can make really big changes. Um, a big fight that's happening by me right now in Illinois is a CO2 pipeline that wants to come through. And the, the company has said, we'll use eminent domain to take your land if you won't give it to us. Well, my county and now another small county, both of which are Republican controlled, have hired lawyers to oppose it. Right. So we're seeing even Republicans in, in these cases. Right. My, my county is my county board is Republican controlled, but they were the first county in the state to hire lawyers and start going at this CO2 co pipeline company and saying, no, you're not coming through Sangamon County. No, you're not, you know, taking our land through eminent domain. Um, so you can these are races that if we get in position, right, we show what we can do and we actually have enough power on the local level to push some stuff through um, as opposed to just getting bogged down and lost in the, the, you know, the bureaucracy and the corruption of the federal government. Local parties can also serve in as electoral coalition for issue movements and various political formations, right? Greens always talk about we want to be the electoral wing of progressive movements. It's far easier to gain that kind of coalition support of other organizations on the local level, right? And we saw that in 2020 with our Left Unity campaign. We had DSA chapters endorse us, but national DSA endorsement was never on the table. They were never going to buck from the, from the, you know, at least tacit support from the Democratic Party, if not outright support, right? Um, th that was just never going to happen. Um, organizationally, that wasn't who DSA was, and that's not where they're at politically even today. Um, but there were locals. There were locals here where I am in central Illinois. There were locals in um, Utah, you know, that were able that, that can and there were a few others I can't remember, but they were the ones that endorsed, right? And that's the same, the same is true, you know, for local candidates I know in Allegheny County in Pittsburgh, right? You all get endorsements from your local DSA. That would never ever happen on the national level um and by forming these relationships on the local level just like by putting ourselves in local power we can filter up that power the same is true with these relationships with organizations like dsa sunrise um, i don't think extinction rebellion gets into endorsements of political candidates right or sierra club you know, these places, when they start endorsing us locally, when we start winning, when we start pushing through our agenda on the local level, now that local is going to pressure their state party, their state organization, right? Hey, these Greens are doing things if we give them the chance. And then that's, when, you know, once that relationship is established on the state level, now you've got a state level pushing the national, right? And I think Sierra Club is probably a great example because they are for all, you know, for all intents and purposes, they are a democratic front, right? They, they almost always back the Democratic Party. Um, but on the local level, for instance, I know our local Sierra Club chapter lead very well. And I think they would endorse a local green candidate, um, right? So the, it, there plays that role. And then one thing I realized as I'm reading this that I forgot, political parties give you longevity, right? Campaigns begin and campaigns end. And usually when campaigns end, most of the people that supported the campaign kind of disperse back out, right? They fade away. But with a local party, there's someone that you can, there's somewhere you can direct people that you meet through your campaigns. There's, um, you know, there's, and that, that local party will last cycle after cycle after cycle. It'll be there. So it allows you to build power in a way that you can't 
if you're just running as an independent, right? If you run for office as an independent, you don't build any of that long-term power, right? You don't, you're not able to really direct it into an official organization that can last beyond your campaign. Um, here in Illinois, if I ran as an independent and I got, you know, across the threshold to get ballot access as a green, that means that whoever ran in my district after me would have that ballot access. As an independent, is only for me, right? It doesn't expend, extend to anyone else. Right? So why form a local party? Because they're what we need for long-term growth, right? Campaigns are like the the, the boosters, right? The, the the shots in the arm that get you going again, right? Um, but the campaign the, that that the campaigns are your your constant influx of new people, new new ideas, new new organizers. But if you don't send them into the party, it just kind of languishes. So I just talked about a whole bunch. I want to see if Garrett has a <laughs> when I, I click the next. Yeah, I, I echo pretty much everything you said there. Um, I, I kind of took some notes as, as you went of uh, thoughts that I had. Uh, uh, one of them to kind of uh, keep going with your your thought here about building a long term organization. That to me is one of the big lessons of the Bernie Sanders campaigns that we saw so much energy go into them in 2016 and 2020. Um, and then where's that energy today? I mean, it evaporated like that as soon as as soon as the primary was over, not even the general election. Um, and that's one of many reasons that it's problematic to uh, work within the Democratic Party. Um, however, that same sort of thing can affect Greens too, if we're focused only on campaigns and not on building long-term power. So, uh, you know, this is why if you've seen our previous 101s for Green Party 101, Eco-Socialist 101, we always insist that the Green Party is both an electoral organization and an activist organization. We have to be able to grow that long-term power. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in one election cycle. But we can keep ourselves motivated by focusing on these issues, uh, focusing on these ground level, you know, local things, uh, meeting our neighbors, uh, you know, building out that support and solidarity with uh, with our neighbors and with, uh, you know, aligned organizations, uh, like Chris was saying, you know, local DSA parties uh, or chapters, I should say. <laughs> You know, uh, but local parties too. That you know, we we've cooperated with our local, you know, socialist alternative and PSL on events, for example. Um, you know, uh, there's various community organizations that do uh, different things here that we work with, and that's where you you start at the ground level. And once you build the uh, the trust, right, and the relationships and the solidarity with each other, you can run candidates that can really win. And um, you know, we we've seen a big jump in that where. You know, our, our candidates for uh, local office, um, you know, we, we've run in a couple of cycles now. And the first cycle, no one knew who we were. But the last cycle, they were getting over 30 <laughs> percent of the vote, you know. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're moving that we're moving that line. Right. As more people get to know us, then they support us and we, we grow the movement. So, you know, there's a lot of reason to um make sure that all of our organizing goes into the long term picture and not just getting caught up in election cycles. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, uh, speaking of issues, <laughs> I think one aspect that forming a, um, a local independent political party is so important compared to, uh, you know, nonprofits in these other organizations is because, well, aside from being captured by the Democratic Party very often, um, they tend to be uh, very single issue focused. And so they end up becoming very siloed. And you even see um, organizations kind of duplicating and repeating work because they're all kind of off on their own doing, uh, you know, this one little very niche thing. <laughs> and what I, the, the promise of a political party is that we have a whole political platform that, you, that can unite all of these issues together. And to see how all of these issues are related through that eco-socialist lens, we can see how all of these issues are actually, you know, fundamental... Um, uh, what would you call it, like symptoms of living in a, a capitalist system that's run by, you know, um, you know, uh, centuries of, or built on centuries of, you know, racism and sexism and patriarchy, all these concepts, right? Um, and when we can unite them all together and realize that these are all actually part of the same struggle, that's when we can really build 
um, a big movement in solidarity. So you don't really see that so much in nonprofits, but you do see that in a political party that builds a platform and runs candidates that unite these issues. Um, and lastly, I wanted to emphasize that it's so important to look at local offices because um, that's where a lot of change happens and a lot of change happens really easily. Uh, it, of course, very, uh, it varies depending on the state. But in Pennsylvania, for example, outside of the major cities, like outside of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, which are kind of the two oddballs, uh, everywhere else in the state, you're talking about town councils or county councils, for that matter, of like three to five people. So if you want to affect like big policy, like in a county, <laughs> you need to win like two seats um, in relatively small elections. Now, of course, recruiting candidates is, is there is part of the difficulty. We have to kind of expand out into those counties and also I'm not saying it's easy or happens overnight either. Um, but I think we have to look at that long term picture that starting from the local offices, we can really win those. And our national candidate database for the Green Party shows that we have a very high success rate when we run local candidates. You know, they win something like half the time when we actually run for local office. Our our issue is not that we can't win. Our issue is that we need way more candidates to run. <laughs> we need to recruit those people. And to recruit the best candidates, you have to have active locals so that you know you know, who's involved in your community? Who's, who's the best activist? Who's, who's a good, you know, public figure that can speak well, all, all of these things kind of come together and they start at your local levels. Um, and so don't, don't write off how important local levels are. Congress gets all the media attention, but you can do so much at your city council, at your school board. Um, in Pennsylvania, we actually elect the people that run the elections. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you just care about fair ballot access, like you could be an elections judge in Pennsylvania relatively easily. And that's that's an important role. Um, you know, and you can get involved in various local boards. Uh, again, it varies depending on the state, but there's environmental boards, library boards, you know, whatever. Start at your local levels and, and make change. And I really want to emphasize how important that is because we're actually seeing part of the reason we're seeing the rise of fascism uh, from the extreme right right now is they have had that strategy for a long time of taking over school boards and things. And that's why all of a sudden you're seeing, um, you know, um, transphobia and like anti CRT language and stuff. It's because these extremists get on school boards because no one was paying attention to them. Nobody was following them certainly not the Democrats. Um, and so they, they've taken power and they've been able to push through an agenda, even though they represent a very small radical minority. Um, so we have to push back against that. And it also kind of shows our own path to build a green movement instead. So um, that's why we need a party. So <laughs> we should move on because I think we've spent a lot of time on that already. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, having that good foundation, I think is important.